So hi everybody. Uh, I'm really excited today because we, we have a rock star of the world of corporate innovation, uh, Tendai Vicky, a famous uh, author of, uh, in particular, of the very famous book called The Corporate Startup, more recently Pirates uh, in the Navy. Uh, so I guess this is going to be really, 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 really good uh, because it, not, not just because we have with Tendai here, but because we have so many people today that this is, this is going to be a very different and special uh, session. So maybe over to you, Tendai, a bit of introduction about yourself. I know you are already famous, but uh, a few words might be uh, helpful for the, the, those few that still don't know you. All right, and thank you all for coming here today. It's Wednesday, probably. You guys probably should be doing something different, but you, you, you'd rather be here uh, in the Innovation Cafe. So thank you all, and over to you, Tendai. Thanks. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen just to make sure that everybody can see me. And then I'm gonna make it gallery so I can see everybody on my other screen. All right, cool. So yeah, I mean, I'm not famous. You would have to convince my children that I'm famous. And also Alex Osterwald's children who asked if he's famous, why isn't he on Spotify? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, <laughs> It's a very interesting conversation. So my name is Tendai Vicky. I'm actually originally born and raised in Zimbabwe. So I'm of African origin. I went to university in Zimbabwe. And then I came to the UK to do like a PhD in psychology because I had a scholarship to do that. So sort of psychology there, organizational behavior for a few years. I thought I was going to have a career as an academic. And then I got a fellowship to go to Stanford. And that's like the pinnacle of being an academic, right? Going to Stanford. But actually what it did is it ruined my academic career because it got me more interested in innovation and technology and startups. And so actually I ended up leaving that career as an academic and starting to do th this kind of work. And so, you know, instead of working with large companies, helping them design their innovation ecosystems, really the reason why they let me come in is because I was the only guy who kind of understood Lean Startup, but also had like a PhD and an MBA. <laughs> so they're like, yeah, we can talk to that guy. And so, and so they let me like start off. And so we were like testing all these ways of how to apply startup methodologies to, to large organizations. And then me and Dan, who you had last week, we wrote the book, The, the Corporate Startup. And that was like the real like launch point that then really gave me the career that I have right now. And so that's where, that's kind of my beginning. And so, so through all the work that I've done, I have kind of noticed anti-patterns, right? That kind of happen out, out in the world. And one of the things that became much more interesting in me is, you know, when you're telling stories, there's always the protagonist and the antagonist, whatever, right? So the, in the innovation story, the hero is the entrepreneur. It's the guy trying to create innovations, right? And the enemy or the antagonist is the organization, the company. The, 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 the MBAs that don't know what they're doing, the leaders that don't understand innovation. And, and that story has been set up in that way and we constantly tell that story that way. But what I started to notice when I was working inside large organizations was that actually the entrepreneur is the antagonist, right? Like they are constantly and consistently getting in their own way. And so the question is, how do we stop them from, from, from getting in their, in, in their own way? And that's what led me to write Pirates in the Navy as an extension of the work that I was I, I, I had done before, and so that's why I, I talk it the uh, you know I call it the uh, the authentic entrepreneur. I, I like John Stapleton's um, avatar. Can you see that? It says John Stapleton, the authentic entrepreneur. You see that? <laughs> Thank you, Tendai. Thank you for noticing that. <laughs> we must hook up later. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so that's really cool. So. One of the things that happens out in the world is that we celebrate, sorry, let me, I need to hide that. We celebrate entrepreneurs a lot. Entrepreneurs are heroes right now, right? We love their stories. We love exactly all the things that make them successful. Like we love entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are, are like the thing to aspire to be. So what we do is when we're teaching entrepreneurship, we're trying to teach entrepreneurs to act like entrepreneurs, but do it inside large organizations. And that's the mistake that we make because for sure there's shared behaviors that entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs should have, you know, stuff like you need to be innovative. Of course, you need to test and iterate on your ideas and, and be market aware. You need to be intrinsically motivated and proactive. These are all characteristics that an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur can share. Makes sense. Very, very clear. 
But there's other things that entrepreneurs have that entrepreneurs should not have, like ego, vanity, brashness, rudeness, <laughs> all these other things, right? That kind of come with this personality of being inventive and creative. And so instead, what, the, what we should be teaching entrepreneurs is that you're not Elon Musk, like you're not an, an, an entrepreneur, you're working inside a large organization. And uh, some of the characteristics that you need to have are actually things that an entrepreneur can never do, which is why they work for themselves. So things like being strategic and making sure that your project is aligned to the overall strategy of the bigger organization, building relationships with key functions such as legal and branding and compliance and all these people that don't know anything about innovation and are busy trying to constrain your work, you know, having political acumen. And people look at this thing like, oh man, I hate corporate politics. If you hate corporate politics, go start your own company. Because the moment that you're working inside a large company, the superpower of the entrepreneur, the superpower, the thing that makes a, a person a serial entrepreneur, somebody who's consistently able to innovate inside organizations is political acumen. That is the superpower of the entrepreneur. They need all the other things. They need to be able to come up with new ideas, test those ideas, iterate, et cetera, et cetera. But if they cannot build relationships inside a large organization, there's no, there's no, re there's no reason to even think that you're gonna be successful. And so in this book by Kai and Krippendorf called Innovation From Within, he's got a really nice quote from the guy who used to, or the gal, I can't remember now if it was a gal or girl, but the person who used to head Nike's fuel band project. And they say that when you're working inside a large organization, you spend like an inordinate amount of your time lining up all the cannons, making sure they're all pointing in the right direction. Because when you're an entrepreneur, some of those cannons are actually pointed at you. So what you're trying to do is to turn them around and point them towards the object, which is to make sure that you have a successful in innovation project. So it says you spend an inordinate amount of time just doing that, lining up all the cannons to point in the same direction. But if you succeed, if you actually succeed at getting them to all point in the right direction and then you let it rip, you have much more impact. You, have, you, you go further than a, a startup can actually go. And so that's really the power of, of entrepreneurship and we need to, to, to harness that, which is why it took me to this notion of like pirates in the Navy, right? We need to make this distinction between being just a, a pirate who is a criminal roaming the seas, raiding and looting army hearties, right? That we need to make a distinction between that pirate and another type of pirate called a privateer. Now privateers were also pirates, but the difference was that privateers were pirates that were attached to a specific institution. So, for example, Sir Francis, Break, uh, Sir, Sir Francis Drake was a privateer for Queen Elizabeth, and his job was to go out there and raid and loot Spanish ships. So you can see, like, this person, they're doing criminal activity in one sense, but they're doing it on behalf of an institution that actually cares for the results that they produce. And so if you're an innovator inside a large organization, the only way you're gonna succeed is if you're doing this sort of groundbreaking, innovative, strange work that's not typical of the company, but there's somebody else inside the organization that cares for the results that you produce. So that when you come back with the results that you produce from the innovation lab, the innovation team, there's actually somebody there ready to embrace you within the organization and actually scale you. So, you know, when, when it comes to leaders within an organization, if it's just like, we're a, we're, a, we're a pirate team, then leaders don't care about your work. If you're found, you'll be made to walk the plank. But if you're a privateer, the leaders are actually invested in your success. They want you to actually succeed. In terms of status, if you're a pirate, your status is very low inside the organization. And even if you succeed, in fact, the thing they hate inside large organizations are successful pirates. Now you've got a really big bullseye on your head, right? When you succeed, they really want to take you down because they don't want that disruptive behavior to be encouraged. Whereas if you're a privateer, your success can actually be widely celebrated. In terms of resource, again, you know, whenever there's a crisis, the innovation stuff gets cut. But if you're a privateer, because you're actually connected to the organization, you're creating value, your resources are consistent and probably sometimes are likely to be increased. And then in terms of projects, if you're a project that is covered when you're a pirate, they will be killed. But if you are a, a privateer, your projects are likely to be taken to scale if they're, if, if they're viable. And so this is the distinction that I'd like us to make, which is an, a corporate innovator is here. To the extent that they can accomplish these things, 
they're much more likely to actually create things, think, think, things that, that scale. So two things to, to just to think about quickly and then we can move to, to Q&A. The first thing you want to do if, you, if you're an entrepreneur and you're working in, in, inside, larger, in, in, inside the large organization is to lose the act. One of the things that I've also found is inauthentic about entrepreneurs is entrepreneurs are, actually think they're doing innovation when they're not. And so here's a fundamental definition of innovation. Take it away, use it wherever you are. When you're working in a company, we say that you've succeeded as an innovator to the extent that you've created something, put it out into the world, and it's creating value for customers and also bringing value back into the organization that you work for. Until that has happened, you haven't innovated. I'm going to repeat that again because it's a, it's a passion of mine, this particular point. You are not an innovator. Have you ever heard that saying that says, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it, does it make us that right? Does it make a sound? This is the same thing. If you are an innovator, but all the stuff you work on never gets to market, nobody buys it, uses it, or changes it, are you really an innovator? Right? So your fundamental job as an innovator is to figure out a way for the things that you're working on that they cross the threshold into customers' hands. And then once they get into customers' hands, they come back around and bring value back. Before that, so then all the other stuff we do, hackathons, sticky notes, da, 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 all this stuff, if it's not pointed towards that goal, it's waste. Okay? And so that's what we mean when we say lose the act. Lose the act, lose the innovation theater pieces of innovation, only utilize those tools for innovation to create value. Right? That's a really fundamental principle because what happens is when we don't get wins, when we don't get early wins inside our organization, stuff that goes out to the market and, and actually creates value, do you know what happens? You're actually poisoning the organization for future innovators. Because what happens is when I, when I then turn up and go, hey, my name is Tendai, I wrote a book, Pirates in the Navy, let me show you how to innovate. The leaders are like, ah, oh, no, we already tried that, it doesn't work. <laughs> That, that's what they say to me. And it's because they've seen teams do in, in innovation theater. So the first thing we want you to do is to lose the act. The next thing that we want you to do, and, and this is a, just an example of like PNG and how the lady there, uh, Claudia Kochka was a name. She made sure that she got an early win by you know, saving one of her brand, one of the already existing brands by using design thinking tools, which then created a movement that got people to be more interested in, in, in the work that she was doing. So that's the first piece, lose that, make sure you're creating value. The next thing is, the second thing is lose the ego. There is not a single entrepreneur inside an organization that ever succeeds on their own, right? You need collaboration. I can tell you right now, like when I meet an entrepreneur, I, 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 I've got a timer on, like my measure is how vain are they? How much cack are they talking about Elon Musk and Amazon and Facebook and all types of stuff. And once they start saying all of that stuff, I put my timer on, three years they'll be fired. I, I just know that. Like I can always tell how quickly an entrepreneur will flame out by how they carry themselves and conduct themselves inside the organization that, that they actually work. And so we, we need to lose the act. We need to be able to collaborate with key functions. My favorite key function is legal and compliance. If I can get those guys to work with innovation teams, we're winning. My other favorite key function is finance. If I can get finance to sign up to incremental bets and funding, we're winning. If we can't get those things sorted out inside a large organization, the innovator is constantly fighting battles. Every time they want to run an experiment, they have to fill in the legal and compliance form, then they have to go to the finance guy. So all of those things we can actually sort out and this is the way you actually succeed. There's a really great book that I, I recommend that you all read. Uh, man, what is the, the title of this book now? I've forgotten. It's a history of um, Bell Labs. I think it's called Inventing the Future or something like that. It's, it's the history of, 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 of Bell Labs. And inside this uh, book, there's a, a quote in there that says that when it comes to innovation, no innovator ever succeeds on their own. The process is too variegated and complicated. An innovator only succeeds to the extent that they can corral all the other key functions to support the work that they do. And then the stuff is likely to go out in, in, into the world and, and actually succeed. And so the only way to make impact is to actually think of yourself and the stuff that you're doing along two dimensions. So again, I'm gonna repeat the first dimension, two jobs for you. The first one is lose the act, right? Make sure that you're working on stuff that actually creates value. So value creation is dimension one for an authentic entrepreneur. 
Then the second dimension is lose the ego, right? Make sure that you're working on projects or, or tools and techniques that allow you to create a cultural change inside your organization in order to make innovation a repeatable process. Right? Because again, innovation is really famous and sexy these days. So we have this phenomenon that I call little fires everywhere. So the first thing that happens is somebody opens an innovation lab. And then in another division, somebody says, mm, we need a skills and learning program to teach innovation. And this skills and learning program has nothing to do with the innovation lab. And then somebody in another division, same company said, mm, we need a corporate venture capital arm. So they open their corporate venture capital arm. And then somebody says, we need to send our leaders to Silicon Valley. So let's open an innovation outpost. So somebody opens an innovation outpost. And then before you know it, you've got little fires everywhere. Dedicated innovation teams, R&D lab, entrepreneur program, startup co-creation, corporate incubator. You've got all of these things going on, right? And nobody is thinking about the value these things are creating. And so my job is to walk into organizations and go, okay, you've got all this cool stuff, but let's actually sort of map it against our two by two and see where these things are actually creating value. Like which of these things are value creation and which of these things are actually helping us build an innovation ecosystem that actually works. This map here is just my own analysis. It's not a true reflection of what these things actually do. So don't take this as like, you know, gospel, but I do have a, I do have a bee in my bonnet about these two things and how much value they create. But outside of that, I, 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 um, I, I, I don't have any problems with, with many of the other things. So this is all stuff that we just need to be thinking about and make sure that we're really, really working on. So that's what my work is about. And that's what the book Pirates in the Navy is about. So you can check that out at a bookstore near you. And I'm ready for any questions that you have. So I, I was right, first of all. This is why Tendai is a rock star, okay? 15 minutes and boom, done, a masterclass. <laughs> no, guys, go read the book and learn something about corporate innovation, okay? <laughs> you can't read the book much. in 15 minutes, though. <laughs> 15 months, maybe, to learn everything. All right, guys, let's start with the first question. I, who wants to, who's the brave guy? <clears throat> Hey, um, this is, uh, oh, oh, we got two of them. No, us. no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> this is Ben Schmuck at, uh, at Caterpillar. Uh, Tendai, I think you know my, my previous boss, Ben Hayfley. Um, you may have met him in the past. Anyway, so my, my question is, um, when, so if you're an innovation manager, right, and teams get, I think, frustrated with being within the entrepreneur mold, maybe they're moving too slow, more slowly than they would like, or, um, you know, they, their, their sort of palette of solution options is limited because of strategic limitations or political limitations. I guess I'm just kind of curious to hear, you know, how do you navigate that? How do you motivate your teams to, to, to be motivated within the, those constraints? Yeah, I mean, I mean, sustaining your motivation is really, really hard, right? I mean, because you, I've been in organizations where it's like, I'm coaching the, the team and, I'm, and then I come back two weeks and go, what happened to that experiment that you were going to run? And they go, we're still waiting for compliance to sign it off. So, so that kind of, it, that can kind of kill momentum and kill energy and really, and really drain the energy. So I believe that if you're leading a team like that, your job is not just to inspire them and keep them motivated. Your job is to also deliberately engage in activity that removes these roadblocks and creates the enablers, right? So we're not just saying, well, just, let's just wait. Let's just, let's endure, you know, that's not really what we're trying to do with them, right? We're trying to say, great, this thing that you've just done has revealed something about the company. So what are we gonna to do to make sure that the next team doesn't have to go through the same roadblocks? And so you start building collaborative patterns that allow you to work with legal and compliance to go, listen, let's get together and figure out how our teams can get to run experiments quicker. What are the rules and barriers or boundaries you wanna set, you know, set for them? So that if, so that if they follow those rules, then they can just run their experiments, right? So those are the conversations that you, that, that you really want to have. It's really hard to keep a team motivated if the, if the brick wall looks like it's going to stay there forever. Right? Oh, I like that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you, Tendai. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question. Mm. And uh, it's, it's more about the culture of, of organization. What do you do when... Um, an organization culture has been built to repel innovation and disruption. 
you know, something happened, like uh, I was brought in into an organization for actually innovative purposes, but um, the culture there is is repelling it. Even the people that, the, the, the executive that brought me in tends to, to find it difficult to to accept the kind of um, innovative ideas I want to like um, roll out and start working on, which was actually what attracted them to bring me in in the first place. So, mm-hmm. so in situations mm-hmm. like that, what what kind of steps do you advise or can you say should be taken to make them feel comfortable with with your innovative ideas? Thank you. That's cool. So, so even the people that brought you in are, are, are like fighting you. It's kind of like my ex-wife. Like if I knew you were like this, I wouldn't have married you. So, so, so they, they think they want what you've got and then they don't want it. Right. So, so that's funny. Um, so I don't know exactly what you're doing. I, I, so it's hard for me to critique the way you're doing the work. I don't know exactly how you're building these relationships and exactly what you're trying to do. So I'll give examples of what I typically see happen. So let's just take it as a given. If you're going into a large company that's had success over a period of time, and you're the guy that's actually about to start their innovation program, that company is built to repel innovation by default. The, right? the people inside the organization are already prepared to fight you by default. Like it's just, that's just the way it is. So the question just becomes, how do you operate within those organizations? And so I often say, and, in, and that's something that's also in, part in the Navy is, don't say anything about innovation like for the first year. Just like spend the first year like having conversations with people about like who, who has anyone tried to create something new here? What happened? Who failed? Who succeeded? And the reason why you're doing that is you're trying to map the landmines. You're trying to kind of map the territory and see like where all the things that might kill you are. So just spend like the first year just doing that. But what, what you're also doing while you're mapping the landmines is you're looking for leaders that I would call early adopters. And these are leaders that, and in every organization, there's one or two leaders that get it. I mean, if you end up in an organization where there's no one that gets it, then you need to quit. But every now and again, like, you know, you you always find leaders that that actually get it. And so it's really important for you to kind of think about that. And then as you're identifying those early adopters and and, and thinking about those early adopters, you've got people to start working with. Once you've identified the early adopters, so you've done the mapping of landmines, they've identified the early adopters, that's who you focus your energy on. The thing about the human condition is we're so focused on convincing our detractors to come and join our movement. But what we're trying to do when we're transforming organizations that are fully resistant to what we're trying to do is we're trying to create gravity towards the movement. So don't walk around your company with a PowerPoint presentation with your plans written on it. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. Because all you're doing is you're forewarning your enemies to set new landmines in whatever direction you're saying you want to go. So just focus all your energy on early adopters, go and meet with them, find out what they want to do, what things they need help with, with innovation and start your innovation program there. And then help them become successful. And as they become successful, work with them to tell those stories into the organization. And then this, those success stories are then what draws a few other people to your movement. And then over time, you've got this kind of momentum. And so. That's what I would suggest you, 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 you do. Hard work, it takes time, but really important to, to do it that way. One question I have, and I usually ask it uh, to anyone who kind of walks into organization and talk about corporate uh, innovation. Um, it always makes me smile when someone, you walk into an organization and says, we, we solved the innovation problem. We've created an, an innovation division or team or whatever you call it, but that's where the innovation happened. So the rest of the company doesn't have to worry about it. Exactly. But, like, and we know, we, we know that like, when you have a culture that supports innovation, it can happen anywhere in the company. Mm. How, how do you keep track or in, like, to, in order to enable those ideas that are bubbling around the uh, the organization to make them happen like because if you have an innovation department and you just push the idea down there you people will lose the ownership and it becomes siloed and political and uh, you don't want that so you want to enable those people around the organization to take control of those ideas and kind of monitor and facilitate those yeah so a lot of thoughts in my head with your question right (laughs) the first one is so I'm from Zimbabwe, African, like, I, like, I, like I've already said. 
and traditionally we have this culture where like married men can eat together but men who are not married cannot eat with married men and so when the married men are getting together and they're having dinner and they're eating they often tell the unmarried men even if they're the same age to say go play over there with the kids and so innovation labs are a bit like that right like we're talking serious business here you yeah. go play over there with the kids right so so that's really really important for us to really think about how do we make that not true how do we make innovation a legitimate part of how companies of how companies do business now there's two pieces of that that need to work together the first one is the innovators themselves have to care like if the innovator goes yay we got a lab good now we can get, go, go do our own thing. We don't have to deal with these MBAs. If they celebrate that as a victory, then they're making a huge mistake, right? So that's the first thing is they can't celebrate that as a victory. From where they're sitting, they have to start thinking, how do we build a bridge from our lab to the core business? Which forces them to then reach back out to the mothership and go, can we speak with legal and compliance? Can we speak with branding? Can we speak with finance? Can we speak with uh, heads of divisions to show them the projects we're working on and, and have conversations about them to say, if this becomes successful, would it be something you'd be willing to take to scale? And not only expect those leaders to say, yes, that'll be something I'd be willing to take to scale, but also say, okay, well then commit two people <laughs> to join us on the project that will work with us, right? And so all of these things are all bridges that we're actually building to make sure that these things become you know, successful. And sustainable. So that's like response number one. Then the other response that I would give you is, how do you make sure, the question you asked, how do you make sure ideas that are bubbling throughout the organization get actually worked on? So one way to think about it is to frame those ideas in terms of like the types of innovations they are. So efficiency and sustaining innovations really easy to do within the mothership itself, like right within the mothership itself using almost similar processes. But once you start thinking about transformative innovation, you want to start figuring out a way, not necessarily a lab, but start figuring out a way to kind of like give it a, a different space where exploration can actually happen and, and, and testing can, can actually happen. And so well, what we did when we were working at Pearson with Sonia Kusevich and, and others, we didn't create a lab. Instead, we created an innovation management portfolio management framework, and we called it the Lean Product Lifecycle. And so what we said was we said to the organization, when we classify a project as this, these are the tools for managing it. And when we classify a project as this, these are the tools for managing it. And then we, we, we built that toolbox and we let it all be managed within the business at the leadership level, decision-making levels that they already had. We didn't create a, a, a separate function. And that seemed to work at least for a while. I haven't been there for a while, so I don't know. <laughs> what, what, what so creating a framework basically yes. you know, to, to define the type of yeah. innovation. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh, I have a question here for, um, for obviously attendee as well. Um, well, first and foremost, the first book that I've that I've read of you was the, the Lean Product Lifecycle, and we're talking right. about corporate innovation. Now, anyone who wants to really have like the full picture of the process, like listen, what a what a great like uh, place to start. So that helped me a lot. Uh, so, I guess the question is: Is innovation overrated in a corporate environment? And let me tell. Let me. Mm. Let me to where I'm coming from with this. So I now work with a company that has over 60,000 employees. Before I was in a company that had like over just 150. So we were doing like a lot of experiments and trying experimenting ideas at a very fast pace. And we were, and we were able to interlink that, that you know, these ideas uh, to the business objectives given the fact that the company you know, was a small company and everyone knew each other. And uh, the, the, we knew what the vision was and what we wanted to accomplish. So should we, should we really uh, hammer down what the first, again, the, the, the framework could be a, a good example. What are we trying to accomplish in, in, in each of the, the steps? And now do we measure that against, for example, a, um, what the, that delivers against like a potential ROI and, and growth in revenues and growth in, 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 in customers? Um, again, starting, for example, with an early adopter. And, but really first nailing, uh, nailing down the, the, fra the, the framework and then move to like this, type of new experiments, uh, but picture that in a corporate uh, level. What, what would you say to that? Would you say that, you know, people are now like talking about corporate innovation, is that a bit overrated and should it be more like, you know, composed in like a, a new type of uh, approach to take products to market or, um, I don't know, I'm just trying to, 
I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a better myself and I had to adapt to this reality. Yeah. And I was like, let's do it, let's do it. But as, I, as I'm, you know, you know, maturing my, my, my time in like in a big, big company, I tend to realize like, you know, again, politics is important, knowing the division is important and, and finding the best ways to take an idea to a scale that matters to the, the company is also key. So mm-hmm. how, do we, how, do we, how do we measure that? How do we picture that in a way that makes sense at a corporate level? Yeah, no, that makes sense. So innovation is not overrated, right? Innovation is underrated. What's overrated is innovation theater. Mm, okay. so people overrate the potential value that innovation theater creates. And then they get disappointed <laughs> when it doesn't create that, that, that value. So if you don't want to engage in innovation theater, the opposite of that is what you've described, which is make sure that you have strategic alignment, make sure that you have a framework for taking things to scale, making sure, making sure you're working on ideas and running experiments and, 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 and testing those ideas before you actually scale them. So those are all the best practices you need. Now, going from a 150,000 person company to a 60,000 person company simply means that the only way that you can move fast and break things or not break things is if you create the road, if you actually pave the road, because there's a lot of roadblocks and trees and, and grass and potholes and all of these have been created by the corporate b- bureaucracy. And so what you want to do when you're working inside a large organization is to pave the road for innovators to say, okay, here are all the tools, here are all the processes, here are all the frameworks. When we were working at Pearson, we got sign off from the chief finance officer to say, now when we're working on innovation, we use metered funding. And do you know how the conversation started? It started with a question that finance people hate, which is how much money would you be willing to give an innovation team if the team couldn't give you a projection of how much money they'll give you back in five years? And they're like, what do you mean? Like every time someone comes to us, that's, a, that, that's the deal. You ask for money and we say, and we say how, how, much, how much are you going to, what, what is the multiple you're going to give us back and when, <laughs> right? <laughs> And we're like, no, 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 this is just people going out to the world to find out if there's something worth investing in. How much money would you be willing to invest to fund people to go to the world to find out if that thing needs further investment? Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, we landed on $350,000. And then it was up to us to decide what to do with the $350,000. And we said, okay, 50,000 for the initial stage, the discovery stage, the explore stage, and then the rest of the 250,000 for the validate stage before you get the bigger sum to go and scale. So that's what we did, right? And then the CFO wrote a, a memo to the organization to say, all innovation projects use metered funding. You use this template, you get 50K, you earn your next 250K, right? And those systems got built in. So we've paved the road. Now, a team doesn't have to think, oh, I have, I have an idea, what do I do with it? They know exactly what to do with it because it's an official legitimate process. And that's the hard thing the hard thing about hard things about moving from 150,000 to 60,000 people is in the 60,000 person organization. If it's not a pre-structured process, it doesn't happen. Right? And that's what we're trying to build. Thank you. No more questions? I think Jordan was trying to, uh, David, David, David. Yes, hello. yes, 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 yes. Yeah, do you, do you hear me? Jordan. Yes, yes I, Jordan. I, I, my name is Jordan. I'm, I'm, I'm living in Africa, in, in Senegal. Ah. I, I have one question for you. What sort of key mistake you have seen entrepreneurs make in your experience? Key mistake? Yes, key mistakes, yes. Right. So many. <laughs> but they're all connected to the same thing, right? They're all connected to a lack of understanding about how much collaboration you need from the big organization to succeed. So whenever an entrepreneur makes a decision that they're gonna go over there and do something and ignore the rest of the organization, that's a fundamental mistake. So, so people who work on projects that are interesting for them but are not strategically aligned to the organization that they work for, fundamental mistake. People who open innovation labs. I once worked in South Africa with an innovation lab that had 14 products out in the world that customers were actually using and enjoying but their mother company would not allow them to scale those things. And then eventually that head of innovation got fired, but they had actually been successful. Like by all metrics you measure labs, they'd been successful. And so the question becomes, how does a company reject something that's succeeding? And the reason why they reject something that's succeeding is because nobody actually cared about it while you were working on it in the first place. 
And so all of those, this kind of disconnect between who I am and what the company wants or building an alliance, that's the fundamental mistake. And it turns up, it shows up in different ways, but it all kind of speaks to that same, same kind of problem. Many facts then they made. David, you were about to ask a question, right? Hi, hi. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, thanks a lot for this uh, excellent sharing. I thank you for that, and Hugo too. Um, I just wanted to hear a, a very specific question about uh, what you mentioned previously of the uh, political acumen uh, competence mm. uh, as a main uh, differentiator. And along your experience and the corporations you, you have analyzed and worked, uh, how do you see that feature uh, in terms of geographical mapping? If you notice some correlation or relationship concerning a nationality, uh, uh, so a country or a region, mm. and, and also uh, regarding the uh, profile of a person, assuming that the company really wants to uh, innovate and is looking for these type of people uh, did you reach um, some type of profile that incorporates that political acumen uh, that would maximize the chances of that person to be successful inside your organization basically mm -hmm. so it's two questions sorry yeah yeah no no that, no that makes sense so the first thing i can say is i really haven't seen cultural differences yet so, you know, I mean, there are countries that are high social distance countries, right? Where people in power are quite distant from the people that they were. So you're gonna to have to approach them in a, in a, in a, in a kind of more, more respectful way when you're having conversations. And that can make it hard for junior innovators to, to be influential because they don't have access to, to, to kind of reach those, 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 those kinds of leaders. And in those organizations, the recommendation is that that the head of innovation should be at the same level as all the senior execs that are in that company. They should be the most, they should sit on the board. They should be part of the C-level. That's very, very important because that allows the conversations to then happen, right? So that's the first answer to your question. And then the second answer to your question is not every single innovator working inside an organization needs to have political acumen. You can literally build a team of people that are good at product design, good at talking to customers, good at going out to the world and, 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 and creating breakthroughs. But whoever is leading those teams has to be great at building relationships. And so this person who's leading this team, there's this kind of weird profile. Have you ever seen like, have you ever watched, any of you watch NFL football, right? And they've got like these big, big linebacker guys or these big defensive guys like, huge guys that can like you know but their they their feet are like ballet dancers like they can move like ballet dancers but they're huge it's like this is kind of mismatch of like that should not that person should not be able to do that right and that's what you're really looking for in this profile is somebody who is excited about innovation entrepreneurial thinking about breakthrough ideas hates tradition wants to come up with more inventive things right and and that's their focus and typically that kind of person is meshed with a profile <laughs> on the personality side that makes them abrasive, difficult to work with, et cetera, et cetera, right? That, that, those things often go together. But this person doesn't have this abrasiveness. They all have all these other really positive characteristics. And then to that, somehow, they have this ability to bring people together, collaborate with difficult people, have conversations with people that, that, are, that, are, that are sort of detractors and, and naysayers and patiently explain to the chief operations officer <laughs> why their project should be prioritized versus another person's project. Um, you know, the, the rude word that's often used to describe them is like, they're like the innovation team's shit umbrella. Like they protect the innovation team from all the corporate nonsense, right? And the more and more folks you have like that within your innovation function, the more likely you are actually to, to, be, to, to be successful. I mean, Alex also calls it the chief ambassador, right? Somebody who plays this role between the innovation teams and, and, and the mothership itself. And there's a few great individuals like that that I've met. And, and the thing you notice about them is that they're serial entrepreneurs. They didn't succeed with just one project. They've done it over and over and over and over and over again within the same company. Any more questions? Feel free to unmute. Jennifer. Um, 
I can ask a question. Hey, um, thank you so much, Tendai, for taking the time for this, and thank you for um, Ugo for doing the Innovation Cafe. Um, so uh, I find myself in a unique position. I know there's one other person on the call too with me, um, uh, joining the um, a massive corporate organization, CPG Focus, mm -hmm. um, and I'm joining as an innovation and creative practitioner, um, and find myself two weeks in now. You know, already understanding, appreciating on one hand that innovation is part of the mothership, right? There's an, a, there's already an adoption of innovation per se into the actual like work and the the day-to-day -day products that we're putting out. However, it all ladders up to the ceiling. We're really at the end of the day. There is no, there 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 really isn't an appetite for for innovation. When I'm doing my discovery and I'm doing my interviews, talking with other partners that are kind of on the ground level with me. Everyone's excited. They want to do bold things. They want to do epic things. They see opportunities. However, there is the ceiling that kind of comes above us where it is a very strict, very small business model that we have to fit within where our bold things are not going to be able to happen outside of that. Mm. So um, th that's kind of the context. You know, I'm huge fan of the book you know I've read the book um, the pirates in the navy because I know that's how I'm coming in you know I know that's two dollar royalty that's two dollars right there <laughs> yes. thank you rock star um, rock star rock star so, no level <laughs> so yeah so I don't know so I, I guess my question is you know how would you consult in that in, in that circumstance when we already know that like yes innovation's in there but we we have a ceiling uh, at like the top leadership where the business model just doesn't, it does not fit. Yeah. So I have a couple questions for you. The first one is, have you been able to find any early adopter leaders that are also frustrated by this? That is one thing that I wrote down in what you were saying about 10 minutes ago, right. you know, when you're answering, I think Sean's question. Um, Yes, and that is now one of my new objectives is to like clearly articulate and clearly find the early adopter leaders, and I think leaders is key mm -hmm. word. I can find a lot of peers at my level who are excited, yes, you know, um, and could be early adopters, but not yet at the leadership level. Yeah, that's the place because that's the fundamental question is if you can find an early adopter leader, especially somebody with like p l responsibilities and can give you budget, then, then that, that's fantastic. Then you just say to them, listen, can you allow us to, to, to create a small space in your business where we run 12 projects to test this innovation thesis and illustrate how the methodology works? And you don't need to invest in any of these projects more than 50,000 per project. Like that's all we're gonna do. And then from there, we'll show you the ways of working and the evidence that we bring. And then you can decide which of these 12 projects go on to the next phase and then which of the remaining six or whatever go on to the next phase. And the only, the only condition in your deal when you're dealing with leaders is when things start to show promise, they have to allow you to tell the story to the rest of the company. That is the condition. You have to be allowed to share that story. <laughs> if they don't want you to share the story, then they're not really helpful because you'll be doing this stuff in secret, nobody knows. When you're done, you'll have the same problem. <laughs> So you want to be able to use those stories to open doors in the future. So if they're willing to let you do that and maybe even help you tell the stories themselves, then that becomes really, really, really helpful. That's, that's the best way to actually do it. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Cool. Any, okay, any, more, any more questions? Yeah. Any other questions? Andre Marquis, are you here? <laughs> okay, Andre. <laughs> Hey, Tadai and, and Ugo. Uh, yeah. Great, great listening to you guys and uh, trying to, to think a little bit has my, you know, I'm, I'm a very uh, small business owner. So mm. I am the CEO of a team of five, six people, depending on the time of the year that we are in. And so I, I cannot complain, um, you know, from the top. Nice. And that means that sometimes I see myself in the exact opposite position, which is, how can I um, make my team innovate more? So, mm. you know, mm. Innovation Cafe is, is a good example of um, a simple disruption in the formats that some of these webinars have been uh, played out. So, mm. for instance, we have been doing uh, webinars, but they, they're, they're not very 
uh, interactive like Innovation Cafe is. So I really appreciate the format that Ugo has developed here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in, in my team, I, I just sometimes I don't feel that um, people from my team are just grasping what is going on. So is there any tricks that I can apply to help my, my team innovate better? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's one trick that always works, which is set the expectation that that's actually part of their goals for the year. So, well, I mean, at the bigger, bigger, bigger level in a, in a large company, like for example, 3M, there, there's, a, there's an expectation, hello, whoever that is, <laughs> there's an expectation that 25% um, of revenue must come from new products launched within the last year. So, the, so you can actually set the goal and say, listen, in this company, you get ahead by succeeding at all the stuff that we're working on for sure but at least 20% of your time must be spent on succeeding on these other things. So each year, let's set what, what is the breakthrough project you're working on. And, and then like, people start really thinking about it in a much more deliberate way because they know that it's connected to, to, how, to how they're gonna succeed within their organizations. Like, I mean, if you have a CEO like that, right, you're really lucky. The rest of us are trying to get the CEO to even talk to us. And so, <laughs> and so that's, a, that, 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 that's a fantastic thing. And that's what I mean when I say like innovation becomes legitimate within the organization. Is, the incentives, the, 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 the way people get, you know, promoted and bonused and everything is connected to that sort of behavior, right? Thanks, Tendai. Cool. All right, guys, one final question, I guess. We are running out of time. Mm -hmm. I, I gotta get dinner with my family, so. <laughs> and okay, stop so I holiday. <laughs> Yeah, 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 we are right in between. Yeah, so I, I will ask the final question because okay. I think incentive and reward mm. is key. We, we can uh, start innovation labs, uh, venture capital, blah, blah, blah. But uh, if the incentive is not there, I think it's not going to change, in particular in very large uh, organizations. What, yeah. what, what do you think about this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I've heard people say is, no, no, innovators don't need to be rewarded. They're intrinsically motivated. <laughs> and just, just give them a lab with like beautiful football tables in it and they'll be fine. That, you know, and that's just not true because if I'm repeatedly creating new net new revenue for the organization and I'm getting nothing back from that, after a while that, that becomes actually demotivating. And so incentives and rewards really ma matter. And so I mean, I've worked with companies that are trying different things. There's a couple of banks that have, have got this system of like, uh, if you join the lab with your idea, you take a 50% cut in your salary, and then you get a stake in the idea that you're working on. So now you've got skin in the game. And so that, you know, th those are the kind of things that I've actually seen happen. And of course, the 3M thing I was talking about, right? And then uh, there's an oil and gas company, actually. I think it's in Portugal. They give, again, they give shareholding. I forget the name of the company. It's not Gulf. It's, it's, a, it's another company. But they give like, uh, you know, share, shareholding in, in, in the startups that, that, that the people are working on. So here's the bit of a problem with that. Cisco tried that, right? And there was an article in the Financial Times about how Cisco tried to sort of incentivize innovation by giving some of the innovators, you know, shareholdings and things they were working on. And then they created all these mini millionaires within, within the organization. And that created a lot of resentment from those teams who had also been trying to innovate, but it failed or those employees would never even got a chance to work on an on innovation project. So the question is just then, how do you balance that incentive system, right? And one of the things that Alice Osterwalder recommends is maybe you incentivize and reward at the portfolio level. So you can imagine you're running a corporate accelerator program, you've got maybe 12, 13 projects in there, the incentives are for the cohort. And so then teams are, it's easy for teams to say, my stuff is not gonna work, let's not keep wasting money on this. Let's actually double down the money and give it to that project that's actually showing success. And then like that, you're much more likely to create, you know, kind of aligned in, uh, aligned in, in, in incentives. Thank you very much. So now we just need to invite Alex Osterwalder to come here. To oh, yeah, well. but I, I, I leave that to you, Tendai. <laughs> hey, Alex, you need to come speak to these folks. They need some of that wisdom. <laughs> Great. I will send him the video. Cool. All right, Tendai. Thank you, thank you very much. I think this was really uh, good, uh, purely, purely a masterclass. I think we, we've learned a lot, but we still need to buy the book. So don't forget to go to Amazon and order the book right now, or the books. And if you right buy now. two copies, I get $4. If you buy three copies, I get $6. <laughs> we want to pay your holidays. I think it's fair. fair. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much. And hopefully we will see each other uh, next week. Okay.
Okay. Cool. Enjoy your holidays, Tendai. Thank you very Thank much. You for Fantastic session. Thank you, Thank you, Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye.